Hello, I'm Andrew Suskind, and I'm a psychotherapist, speaker, and author based in West Los Angeles since 1992, specializing in trauma and addictions. Welcome to our podcast, which I named It's Not About the Sex, also the title of my recent book. Here we focus on all topics related to compulsive sexual behavior, often referred to as sex addiction. In particular, we explore ways to build long-term sustainable recovery while establishing more meaningful connection and greater intimacy. Our intention is to offer fresh viewpoints, brand new perspectives, and practical user-friendly tools toward living a more deeply connected life. Let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about the gratitude of loss. And where that comes from is the second chapter in my book, It's Not About the Sex. And Sue Merlino, my fantastic friend and sound engineer (laughs) who's with me today, will be conversing with me about grief and loss and how it relates to sex and love addiction. So thank you so much, Sue, for being here with me. Oh, great to be here again. Awesome. Thanks for inviting me. Oh my gosh, I would have it no other way. (laughs) So, um, as we know, your book is out, and we had that wonderful launch party a few weeks ago, which was fantastic. Wasn't it fun? It was a lot of fun, and it was just so neat the way it um, crossed over with our friends who were here from from the East Coast, so that was fantastic to see them. It was crazy having people from my childhood, from college, from grad school, colleagues from my recent life. It was like all areas of my life were covered. So of course, having you around is, is vital. And I'm so glad you, you live out here now. I know. It's fantastic. So I do have your book and noticed your second chapter that we're, we're talking about today is called the gratitude of loss, which kind of seems like why should we be happy when we lose something? And, and, um, so just kind of want to springboard off of that. And like, what does that really mean? How does that even relate to compulsive sex? Well, thanks for asking. Gratitude really can be applied to almost anything, but in this case, the gratitude of loss is turning something upside down from what most people think about most of the time. Grief and loss really gets a bad rap in our society. There's not a whole lot of room for it, and there's not a whole lot of emphasis on talking things out, processing, and getting to the other side or integrating the losses. So I believe that that loss and, and grieving losses is actually a fantastic tool for healing and can really make a difference in long-term sustainable sobriety of sex and love addiction. So I chose to write this chapter because nobody talks about this, and I I feel strongly that it's a way for us to truly get to know ourselves more deeply and add another dimension to the healing process around recovery. Yeah, that makes sense. Nobody really does talk about that, about the loss and and. When people are grieving, there's a big disconnect. They like people just like I, I I sense that people just push people who are grieving away. They don't want to be included in that. They don't want you know. And it's it's it is our society. Other societies don't do that, but we kind of we kind of shy away from that and supporting that. You know, I, I want to say that grief is almost taboo in our society. Some companies, for instance, will give people a few days off for bereavement. What's a few days, really? I mean, in many traditions uh, through the ages, there's been at least a week or more, sometimes a month, of customs and rituals to address grief. And the reason for that is because they know, they have the wisdom to say that it's something that will help people move through the grief, celebrate the losses, and, and really integrate whatever that is into who they are. Yeah. It's important. So one of your subtitles I noticed was called Doors Opening, Doors Closing. And can you say a little bit more about what that means? Sure. The title actually came from a Broadway tune, Doors Opening, Doors Closing. 
And a friend of mine used to always mention that particular song when he was ending a chapter of his life and starting a new one. Usually it was after a breakup of some kind. And what I really appreciate about the idea of doors opening and doors closing is that when we close a door on something, we're also opening a door on something new. And so grieving isn't just about the past, but it's about integrating the loss in the present and starting to envision a new future. And so instead of thinking of grief as a burdensome, heavy, sad process, it can actually be a more comprehensive way of looking about how we move, that that it's actually an action. Grieving can be an action moving from the past into the present and then towards the future. Got it. So just a little bit more on that, if that's okay, if this is okay. Um, is there, is, I know we touched upon the, in the last question, but is there a timeline? Does it matter when that happens? Like some people might um, not even accept the loss or acknowledge that it even happened and just try to like pretend it didn't happen and just go through their day. And then maybe a, a month or maybe not even that long, that's when the grief hits. Like, does that happen? And is it okay at, at whatever point it hits you to then start the process? Or is it too late? Can there be a too late time? Right. I don't think there's ever a too late time. And I don't think there's ever an exact time frame on grieving. Because keep in mind that grief is not just a finite process. Usually when we're talking about a loss, like losses from sex addiction, we're really talking about layers and layers and layers of losses that have been experienced in one's lifetime. So we may be talking about losses that have to do with being out, acting out in in sexually compulsive ways, but we're also tapping into parts of memory that have to do with all of the many painful losses or the kinds of losses that may not have ever been addressed at the time. So to answer your question as far as time frame goes, I don't think there's a cookie cutter answer for Mm -hmm. that. Some people are more able to, to get started with their grief early on. But because there's really not a societal kind of container for grief many times. Often it has to begin in a therapy office or with a sponsor or with a recovery coach where somebody points out, wow, this is a lot of loss. Have you thought about the grief that goes along with your addiction? I was really struck with the idea of breaking up with your addiction. Uh, How does someone actually break up with an addiction? It's such a great question, and I actually had a lot of fun coming up with this idea. I believe that it's really dependent on one's willingness to finally say that they're no longer going to be participating in the compulsive behaviors or the out-of-control sexual behaviors that they have experienced in the past. And since my book is mostly talking about what happens once somebody gets sexually sober and has stopped the behaviors. I'll just focus for the sake of of your question on the effects of the breakup, okay? So breaking up with your addiction really refers to the idea that it's really like saying goodbye. Mm -hmm. And we're only ready when we're ready, right? We have to be at a point where it's gotten so bad that we just cannot continue in it anymore. And so it's that moment of clarity that it's time to go and that the relationship is no longer working. Now, with that said, addiction, by definition, early on is a way of adapting. It's some coping mechanism. It's a coping mechanism. It's a way to cope. It's a way to survive we could call it a survival strategy it's actually an attempt to feel better but eventually it doesn't work anymore and that's when someone would 
be interested in possibly breaking up mm-hmm. with their addiction. Now, sometimes people have been in relationship with their addiction for many, many years. It could be up to a decade or, or sometimes even a few decades. Let's say somebody has been sort of a functional drinker for many, many years. Or let's say somebody has had multiple, multiple affairs and a long-term relationship with pornography, you know, something of that sort, mm-hmm. which has been part of their life and part of their self-soothing for a long, long time. So breaking up with the addiction is really about saying, okay, enough, I'm done. And then how do I do that? Do I text the addiction? Do I just cut it off cold turkey? Do I say goodbye over time and just in in sex addiction because it's about harm reduction and sometimes it's not clear cut? Sometimes it's really about something that's going to unfold and, and little by little get whittled down to the point where what we call the bottom line behaviors are no longer part of one's repertoire. So to summarize, a breakup comes in lots of shapes and forms. Sure, yep. And it's also something that is determined by an individual. There's nobody can, who can tell us, nobody told me when it was time for me to break up with my addiction, for instance. I needed to come to terms with the fact that it was not working in my life. It was causing too many problems. I couldn't get it off of my mind. And it just wasn't produ- productive right. at that point. Right. So, but that's right. being super mindful and mature, even you know, to to have some self reflection. I think to make that decision. But for different addicts, I'm I'm sure it's handled differently. I mean, I think ultimately you do have to make that decision. But if you have a number of DUIs, or if it's impacting, if you're a pilot or something like that, and you have a drinking problem, it. It, it can be forced on you to to say you need to make the decision. Ultimately, yeah, it is your decision. But I think there are other factors, even health, like the loss of being able to, I don't know, like STDs or things like that, you know, that, that can help you probably just awaken to the idea like, uh, yeah, maybe I need to do this. Right, and it has to break through the denial, right, because – It has to get bad enough to wake somebody up. So using myself as an example, in 1994, I was acting out sexually every single day in one form or another. And so a lot of time, a lot of canceled appointments, a lot of all-consuming thoughts were, were part of my everyday way of being. And I knew that it was done. I wasn't getting any satisfaction from it, but it was something that I wanted to stop, but I couldn't. And someone maybe a few months back had told me, and this is in 94, they said to me, you know, there's this program out there called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And you might want to consider it at some point, because I think what you're saying to me is that this is something that's out of control at times. And I tucked that away, and it took me about a year after that to go to my first meeting. And that was my moment of saying that I was powerless, it was unmanageable, and I needed help. You were ready. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in therapy at the time, but the therapist didn't really push me in that direction. That wasn't what we were working on in therapy. Mm. It was more that person who I found actually in a park oh, and who yeah yeah you never that's know what happens I'm yeah, telling you exactly yeah and so perfect that was my example of breaking up with my addiction was admitting that it was a big problem and making it to my first meeting and I've never turned back so you brought up the word um denial which leads me to my next question um denial is one of those stages of grief and um, what are the stages and how do they relate to recovering from compulsive sexual behaviors? It's such a great question. And I, I really feel so honored that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's like the pioneer of grief theory, gave us these stages of grief 
denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I'm not going to go into all five. I think they're kind of self-explanatory, but I'll say that again. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But what she taught us is that these are the primary emotional states. These are the stages that most people go through as they're getting ready or they they are saying goodbye. Usually, in her case, uh, she was talking mostly about the death of a loved one. But we're talking about the death of an addiction. And these stages are not necessarily linear. They can go back and forth. For instance, I could get to a point of acceptance in saying, yes, this addiction has been destructive and just isn't working in my life. But then something happens and I get angry about it. And I need to go back and do some more work around the anger, the resentment, and, and the feelings that mm-hmm. haven't been completely dealt with. So ultimately, like in program, we talk a lot about acceptance. And acceptance is the answer to all my problems today, <laughs> is the first line of the acceptance prayer. And acceptance is very, very powerful, because if we really are able to adopt that, and it's truly a, a spiritual, existential kind of surrender, it really is a moment of knowing that there's something greater than myself and that I can really accept life on life's terms, my relationships on relationship terms, and myself for for who I am and, and of course, the losses and the possibilities in in the future as well. Right. So um, we talk about losses and grief around losses, and it's not actually death it's uh, addiction and um, a lot of times I guess um, we're grieving the fantasy that we've created it's an illusion that we want to be a part of and um, it's fascinating to me because I never thought about what it takes to say goodbye to a fantasy and uh, tell me a little bit more about how how you would do that well, now you're really making me turn back the hands of time because I'll share a story with you. In 1993, I was dating somebody who I was absolutely head over heels for. I I was so smitten with this relationship that I thought I really had landed it big, that this was the most amazing person that I ever could could be dating. Um, He happened to be a casting director in Hollywood. Wow. He was a little older. He was maybe a little wiser, I'm not so sure <clears throat> in retrospect, but I was very impressed. And unfortunately, I, l- I think what happened was I was falling in love with the fantasy of who he was. I imagined about his powers, his wisdom, mm-hmm. and don't get me wrong, he, he was a, a good guy. But I was lost in the idea of him, the fantasy of him. And we might talk about that in terms of love addiction. Because love addiction isn't about the addiction to love. It's about the addiction to the fantasy Mm -hmm. of love. Sure, yeah. And one thing that I've learned through that relationship is that Okay, better. One thing that I learned about that relationship is that I have a tendency for love addiction. It really speaks to the longings that I had to be taken care of, to be understood, to be seen, to be heard, to be respected. And love addiction comes from the roots of our childhood. Unfortunately, although there was a lot of love and good intentions around me, my mom in particular was not really good at knowing how to love me the way I wanted to be loved. She just didn't have the capacity, and there was a lot of gaps between what I hoped 
could be. So there was a, a loss of the fantasy of my mom being the mom that I wanted her to be. And the same thing happened with this boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we're reenacting and recapitulating these experiences that are need, need to be worked through. And in this case, I was with a therapist who was fantastic because she got it right away. And we worked on it for several years on and off, this idea of grieving the loss of the fantasy. Wow. And so when we're talking about the gratitude of loss, I can't tell you how grateful I was for Darlene at the time, my therapist, because she pointed out something that I just didn't see in myself. It was a blind spot that was really a, a very excruciating part of my background that was getting reenacted in ways that just were not working for me. And so the, the best thing about that painful experience, and, and by the way, I, I, I did get very depressed after the breakup, and I did have a, a time where I was just not sure how I was going to move on, actually. I was just really very paralyzed by it. It was like hitting bottom in my love addiction, and there's only one place up from there. And fortunately, I, I have, and I still do have, a lot of love in my life and emotionally reliable people that I can lean on and that can really be there as a support and a container or grieving the loss or the losses. Fantastic. But so that she was able to hone in on that very quickly and, and get that process in motion. And it was such a contrast from my mom. Right. My mom was very well-meaning, but she was not very good at attunement. In other words, she, she didn't really get who I was on a deeper level. And when I was working with Darlene, she just held the space for me and she really got me from the get-go and it was just such a healing relationship to be in therapy. I was with Darlene for about six years wow. and it was like, it sounds weird, but like going back to the womb in a way right. and truly having the reparenting that I didn't get from my real mom. Well, it's those patterns that just repeat and you knowing the outcome. So that's how we tend to do the same things over and over and over because we have the coping mechanisms in place. And if we don't, we create them and that's the addiction piece of it. So, um, it's amazing to be able to get through that and not knowing, like when you went in there, you weren't like, well, I was missing this in my childhood. You didn't even realize that. Exactly. Yeah. And as we're speaking, what I'm aware of is that I feel so grateful for that loss, right? Because I, I, I truly learned about parts of myself that I wouldn't have learned about otherwise. Right. I'm so grateful for Darlene. I'm grateful for the boyfriend that was a fantasy because I, I got to look at, at things that I never, ever would have looked at otherwise. Right. So that, and so it makes sense, like the chapter that you wrote and um, the gratitude for having that relationship and having that fantasy lost and grieving it was actually the door closing and another door opening and it just all ties together. So that was great. It does. And, and the last thing I just want to say is that gratitude has gotten a lot of attention these last few years, positive psychologists, I believe, have brought it into the mainstream in ways that it wasn't before. And of course, Oprah also I, has yes, been a huge a big proponent. Gratitude, yeah. <laughs> but they're doing lots of research. This is not just new age stuff. Right. They're doing lots of research about how it affects our nervous system and how it affects our well being. And so the gratitude of loss is just another dimension of how we can have gratitude for everything in our life that it's not just about gratitude for a blue sky or for right. a puppy or something that puts a smile on our face it can be something that was really really difficult that also became something hopefully that had a silver lining to it that that created a more dimensional self 
Yeah. There's lots of lessons to be learned. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sue. I, I, I love having this opportunity to have a conversation with you. And this particular topic is close to my heart and you're close to my heart. So <laughs> it's been great to spend the time together. Yeah, it's great learning new things with you, Andrew. I appreciate it and look forward to the next time. Thanks for listening today. It was so terrific to have my friend and colleague, Sue Merlino, to have this conversation about the gratitude of loss. And I do look forward to sharing more with you, much more with you in future podcasts. And thanks again for being here today.